Well, um, say like hello stuff and do all of the stuff I do. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, it looks like we are live, so uh, we are going to get started. You ready? All right, we're ready. All right, good evening, everyone. We are excited to have the Natural We Community Hour once again. Um, breath in and a deep breath out. And just continue with that same breathing, breathing in and out, <clears throat> and breathe out through your mouth, and breathe in. Breathe out grief, and breathe in peace. Breathe out anger and breathe in joy. Breathe out, breathe in, and know that you are enough. You are full of life. Breathe out all the despair. Breathe in all the hope and breathe and just breathe, be. And when you are ready, feel free to open your eyes as we get started. Again, welcome to Natural Week Community Hour. Um, we're excited again to just have another time to come together, even though it is virtual. Um, but we do this knowing that we are more than well, we are able to adapt and uh, come together. So we're once again excited. And without further ado, I am going to introduce our guest for the hour. I'm very excited um, to introduce to you all a progressive pastor a humanitarian, a change agent. Um, he is just a wonderful person. Um, he is Reverend Pastor Q.E. McKinney of the New Providence Baptist Church. We are very excited to have him. Um, I can go on and on and on. I've known Reverend McKinney for some time now, what, 11 years? More like 13, almost. You're right. Uh, <laughs> uh, 13 years. So it is just a privilege to be able to introduce him um, in this capacity, just a wonderful human being. Um, and we're just going to get started. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll go from there. All right. First, I want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Robinson and to the Natural We uh, community uh, for the invitation to come and to share. Uh, my name is Q.E. McKinney. Q.E. stands for Quentin Edward, born and lost, born and raised in um, Watts, Gardena, uh, and everywhere in between. Uh, went to uh, King Drew High School, uh, went to uh, UCLA class of 2006. Um, married. Uh, I've been married to a wife that you introduced me to. Uh, we've yeah. been married uh, 11 years. We've known each other uh, more than 12 years. Uh, I have a uh, nine-year-old uh, daughter, Cadence, and a five-year-old son. And uh, Cadence loves piano and singing, and Carter loves football and eating. Not sure where he gets that from, but... Uh, it's a joy uh, to be here with you today. And uh, oh, yes, and let's let's not forget, I am also uh, the senior pastor of the New Providence Baptist Church, uh, located at 102nd and Normandy off of Century in the city of Los Angeles, uh, as well as I'm the 
International uh, Compensation Manager for World Vision International, uh, which is a humanitarian organization that services um, basically every country in the world and so we we do great work there and so uh, I think that's a lot to take in thank you and we are excited again to have you thank you so much um, and yes I take full credit for introducing you to your wonderful wife so as always, I accept steak dinners and snow crab and any food in between, uh, yes. you know, that's out there. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we have, we, Quentin and I, Pastor McKinney and I love, enjoy talking about food. Um, many of our exchanges have been about which food truck we have discovered or when we travel, what restaurant do we need to hit up and the other yes. person goes. It is absolutely fun, um, a great time. But I think that uh, one of the things um, that has been wonderful um, in terms of New Providence and you as pastor is that Natural We has actually had the privilege of collaborating with a few events um, and New Providence really, really uh, embracing naturally community and what we do at the um, and supporting us. Um, and so we just thank you for that. What was what has that been like as a a pastor having this uh, naturally community organization who is you know celebrating Black people? Um, how has that been as a as a pastor for you? Um, it, it, it's been a tremendous, uh, outreach, um, mechanism and tool to be able to embrace, uh, our heritage and our culture and to be able to come together and do something that is positive. And I think, uh, that, that is, uh, one of the greatest things uh, that we can do as brown and black people is to embrace each other and to build each other up and to um, tear down walls of separation, any walls uh, uh, that have a tendency, you know, to, to, to put us into different uh, uh, boxes, if you will. And so uh, my position has always been in, let's embrace each other. Uh, let me do whatever I can to help you. And then when I help you, in turn, you're helping me. And then if we're helping each other, we'll, we're helping so many other people that we can reach. And so uh, that's kind of my approach in everything that I do, that uh, what I do, um, I don't do it unless I know it's going to help somebody. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's a blessing of God that I have been given. I think I've I think it's also something that is learned. You know, seeing uh, seeing and reading our history and disparities, and knowing that when we help each other, we are healing ourselves, as it were. And so, uh, uh, the the natural we has been a blessing. All of the the concerts, the uh, the show, the hair shows, the uh, modeling shows, which I was uh, a feature in, you know. Um, but uh, all of those things, everything that you have done has been uplifting and has helped uh, brown people see themselves in such a, a tremendously positive light. And uh, I'm thankful just, just to play a small part, whatever we can do, we're always here to continue to, to lift our sister and our brothers up. Thank you. And um, that I, I almost forgot that you actually were in our hair show um, and, and now that you said it, I'm recalling it, that was um, wonderful to have you there. Um, you and then there was another pastor, uh, Pastor Jack Lewis, who were actually yeah. featured in the show. And um, I remember one of the scenes in that particular hair show where uh, you guys actually depicted a baptism and how it has been 
part of not only Christianity, but our culture and what we do in these. Um, and so it was great having you um, in. And uh, we didn't know that everything would be going on here in the world. Um, um, just in case it's not the broadcast. Um, we did we didn't know that your um you know so many people in our community would be would be kind of grieving now um in this week uh that we're in and this uh we know that we're quarantined that was part of the reason why we started doing the community hour but when you and I decided what week you would be on um the call we didn't know that you would act that it would be in a time where so many of our people are just um, grieved and, and, and hurting with yet another senseless, um, not just senseless death, but, but murder, you know, we'll call it what it yeah. is. And um, I, I remember a few years ago, there was, um, there was some war and New Providence was actually in the zone of the game war. It was like a, a hundred deaths in a hundred days. Yeah. Um, how, how did that affect you as a pastor, knowing that your church is in the community that this is happening in? Um, but no, but still having church services. How do you, as a pastor, wrap your head around that to not only, you know, still make sure that we have a church service, um, but also touch the minds and hearts? Uh, of of your congregation and in, in encouraging and continuing to live life positively and in a manner that will will help and free one another. Yeah, you know, um, uh, the church is in the area of uh, Los Angeles called uh, Westmont, and you're correct. Uh, we had um, that period of of the rise of deaths. And so it, it really drove us to a point of prayer uh, and a point of unity where we were unifying ourselves together through prayer and through um, just, just seeing about each other's needs, uh, making sure uh, that they were safe, uh, taking extra precautions. But uh I really do want to drive home prayer because prayer is prayer is essential because it really it really in my perspective prayer allows uh, stress to relieve relieve itself and allows the brain to breathe you know because we're 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 so cumbered with stress and the loads of things that we have to do and and when we come together there there is there is a supernatural power in prayer and and touching and agreeing and uh, agreeing that that God will sustain us and will protect us and so to piggyback on the first mention you know this this week is this week has been um a week filled as you said you know with with grief and shock and horror in watching the video of yet another uh young man with promise and vision and vitality and and so uh uh how how do we approach that? And I think that's a great, you know, possibly a list of questions that you had. But how how do we how how do we, you know, the church address such an atrocity and try to um, uh, help our members and help people who are listening to us deal with this? You know. Um, I find it, I find it a tragedy uh, that here we are, 2020, and apparently the years don't matter. Apparently the years uh, don't matter because racism is still being taught. Um, racism and uh, uh, murder of someone because they're of a different skin color, profiling, all of that is still in play 
Um, I would I would have argued some years ago that it was still in play in, you know, some more of the red states. But uh, to be quite honest, in California, it's just as soon assumed here as anywhere else. And so, in other words, it's everywhere. And so um, it, it is a tremendous burden on uh, black America. And I think being a black male who has a son and has brothers and a dad, you know, it, it really makes me think twice about everything I do and how um, I actually had prepared something in response to this from Luke chapter 11 uh, verses around 47, where uh, Jesus is arguing He's arguing his points against the uh, scribes, and what what he's what he's saying is, he says that um, he says, "Woe to you uh, who build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed, so you are witnesses and you consent of your fathers, for they killed them." And so, in a way, when I see deaths like uh, Ahmad's death. Uh, when I see deaths of Trayvon Martin, I see the killing of prophets. And, mm -hmm. and this text of scripture from Luke 11, verse 47 through 51 is quite powerful. And it's, it really speaks to the condition of, of today. Um, it even mentions in verse 51 where it talks to, it talks about Abel. And so how when Cain killed Abel, his blood cried from the ground. And really, these deaths are the deaths of the prophets. Uh, and the thing is, when prophets are killed, their messages are still heard. And so that's why Cain's blood cried from the ground, because the message of what he had, what happened to him continues to flood the hearts and the minds of the generations to come. And so it's it's unfortunate, it's tragic, it's sad that Trayvon had to lose his life. Now Ahmad has to lose his life and so, so many others between the two of them and so many millions, if not tens of millions, if not more throughout history had to suffer. But I, it, this scripture kind of helps me in the context that they are prophets who were killed because of the message that they brought. And really, you and I are prophets of to a generation trying to, to empower them with positive words. And so uh, when we take a, a, a scope view like that, we really have to dig deep and say, uh, their lives are so much more impactful because now they they have been killed just by the color of their skin, but they just have been killed. Their death has caused an uprising. In fact, just now, uh, the two, the dad and the son were arrested, thank God. But that still does not, that, that, that still does not uh, satisfy the death but the death becomes a prophetic announcement for a people to be alert that you are being hunted down, that you are being chased. And so uh, as that long seg segue, I had to say it, but, but we, how, 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 how do we approach it? We, we approach things like that with what the scriptures have to say, and the scriptures are flooded with things that can help put what we're dealing with into the right context. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions from our, our viewers. The first question is, uh, how, are we being, a, are we becoming numb as a community to these attacks um, on black men? And how, how would you respond as, as a pastor of, at a predominantly you know, black church? I would answer that with absolutely yes. Uh, we are being numb because it almost doesn't elicit 
the response that white America would give if a young white boy were killed. If a young white boy were killed by a black man, there would be such a tremendous response. It would get the governor's attention. It would get the president's attention. It would get everyone's attention. And so because so many of us are being cut down and the excuse that the other side would use is that, well, you know, most of the killings are at the hands of other black men. But it is a cyclical, systemic, racial depression that has that has set that has that has taken taken inhabitants in our minds so much so that when we get pulled over, black men know what to do. Black women know what to do. We've been trained. We've had to be, we've had to have conversations with our youth that if you get pulled over, if you get talked to, if you see the police act a certain way, which which that's contrary to white white America, they know nothing about that. But yes, we are numb because it happens so much in the news that it's just another one. Whereas it shouldn't be another one. It should be the last one. And what what are we going to do about it now? Who's right. going to stand up now? Who's going to address it? Who's going to to uh, you know hold their fist up in the uh, the city halls and the states and say, hey, hey, change these old laws. You can't go chasing after somebody because of some antiquated law that you think they're the criminal and when this young man was killed a few a few weeks ago he was not the criminal he had no weapon and so but they chased him they hunted him like a deer and right. so we shouldn't we are numb because society is flooded with the negative skew of another African American dying and we've been numb because it's been happening so much until it happens personally. No one really wants to get involved. We just kind of mark it on our calendars and say, well, you know, it happened. God bless the family. I'm praying. Well, sometimes prayer is not the only thing that you can do. Some sometimes we really we really have to ask them, what can we do in California to help you? What what can what can we do to help push these people get get placed in jail for killing this young man? So the answer is, again, yes, we are numb. But if we would resuscitate ourselves with the truth that it should not be happening on a daily basis. If we would resuscitate ourselves and I really think. Being in quarantine was almost a good thing because it really makes people think about what's most important to them. And it really has caused us to think deeply about how we are affected and, and, and uh, uh, you know, how, how to prepare for the world when we go back out. And so this this may be a great time to to reevaluate how we respond in times like these when Dr. King has been dead over 50 years and there are still people that look like him and I being killed. So, yes, we are numb, but it should not be so. There's got to be somebody that's, that has an emboldened resolve and a response to get somebody's attention. All right, and thank you. And you started to answer the next question. The next question is, when are we going to protect our, our profits? And I want to kind of expound on that a, a little bit more, which is why I'm also grateful that you agreed to be on this call because uh, you already talked about, you know, Yes, we pray, but go, but going beyond the prayer, right? We we've heard this faith without works is is dead. Yes. Um, and, and and you know we see this like you can pray for a job all you want, but you got to submit your resume and put put the application out somewhere. And um, 
there's been a lot of commentary in terms of what is the Black church doing? Again, the Black church isn't doing anything, and we have a lot of these mega churches that are put on the spotlight in terms of, see, there's, it's just all about the money for churches. But then when you get into the community churches, right, the yeah. churches that are filled with families, are, they're not on the, they're not going viral every Sunday and everything. What, right. How, as a pastor, do do we, do you, your, the, the ministers, the congregants, how do we, yes, protect our Black prophets in, in continuing um, in this, in, in this more and going beyond the pray. Yes, we pray. And then the applicability as well. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the burden on that question is getting people who are willing to stand up. And the problem is a lot of people don't want to stand up because they they think they have too much to lose. You have a lot of black and brown America who are leaps and bounds past what their ancestors did. And, you know, they have homes on the hill. They're well, well educated degrees on the wall. Bang plan they've done well and really don't don't want to cause a fuss they'll tell you it's wrong you know they'll cuss at the tv they'll do all of those things but won't take the next step and so um the next step really is organizing and unifying bodies of believers. And I'm not just talking about Christians. I'm talking about bodies of believers in knowing that what's going on is wrong. All right. And I've always thought that obviously uh, it needs to be decently and in order, but it needs to continue. I think what happens is we fight for a little while and then we put our hands down. If you look at the, the biblical account of Moses and how he had to keep his hands up in order to defeat the enemy, and when his hands were slipped down, the enemy started to win. And so Moses said, you know, uh, he he had to get some help, somebody else to hold up his arms. And so it's really like Moses is black America and we need some other people who are willing to hold up the hand of Moses so that we can fight back. But the problem is, you know, we, we are too, we're too comfortable. We're too uh, non-confrontational. And I'm not arguing, you know, for any violence, because I also think this way. I think that uh, they expect violence from us. You know what I'm saying? And so we, ha we have to be careful that our responses are targeted in such a way that really impacts them. I would say media bombardment. Let them know right away. In fact, I love the fact that when these people get called and these racist people are, are telling someone they can't uh, come to this park or they can't park here or they can't shop here, people are getting them on their phones and they're recording them. And these people are losing their jobs because they are idiots. Excuse my language, but they're idiots. And they they are not they are not uh, 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 they don't even have the respect to to know that you and I are living, thinking human beings. And so the problem is, where do we get some people who are willing to stand up and say, enough is enough? And I may not be violent with you because that's what you expect from me. You expect me to be violent, right? You expect me to cuss you out. You expect me uh, to have my pants hanging down. You expect me to be hood and a thug. You, you expect all of that. In fact, most times, wherever I fly around the world, whatever plane I'm on, white people pass me by. All right. I'm six, two. I'm really wide. I'm about a size 52 in the jacket. OK, I'm a big dude. And white people 
nine out of 10 will not sit next to me. College educated, money in the bank, house, car, they will not sit next to me. Clean shaven, mustache, smelling good, haircut. They will not sit next to me. I could have all more stuff than, than, that's, than their worth in their whole house. But because of the color of my skin, they are not comfortable. So we have to get them where they are not comfortable. Keep it in their face on Instagram, on, on Facebook. Let them continue to share it. Have, have white people that are in support of the black cause, have them share it. And if we can bombard them in this new age of social media, then a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff has to be quieted down. Because, you, because we really have to understand that we are human beings. The black man knows that. The black woman knows that. But do the other side, does the other side know that? Mm -hmm. You know, they, 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 they tolerated Obama, right? Some of them wanted change and then change didn't really seem all that good. And then the other one got in after him and now he's a flaming fool and now he's all right. He's only all right because he wants to make America white again. And so we got to be careful and we have to be people that stand up and bombard. Bombarding on social media doesn't cost us anything except energy and the will to do it. If we can do it and get it out there and let, let it be known that what's happening is wrong. I believe we'll we'll have some headway made. Thank you for thank you for that answer and and the emotion behind it, especially when we're talking about an issue of of, of racism, the systemic historical and I say historical meaning it continues to happen over history and over time, and yeah. um under and understanding that uh you know. Uh, you know, in church, you you have have done many a sermon talking about our identity and knowing um, who you are. In fact, one of one of the one of your classic lines when you're preaching is, "Lord, help a black man today." Uh, mm -hmm. You you know, you get your head and you go. <laughs> um, but one of the things about that, what you were saying, and, and paralleling it to Moses with with the with the hands up, is and, and then bringing in Dr. King. Is one of the things about that that uh, about Moses in the Bible with that particular battle is as the hands were getting tired, um, Aaron and Ur in the Bible came along and held the hands up. So Moses was tired, but his hands still were up because there was a support, and there and there were others who also believed and joined in the cause. And so when we're talking about that now here in the present and continuing this, you know, we do have Black Lives Matter, and Black Lives Matter is made up of you know more uh, you know Black Christians, Black Muslim, Muslims, those who practice traditional belief system, um, different diff all these different people who are Black, and then there is the, the allies portion of Black Lives Matter. But I'm going to put stick on on Black people right now, and then going to and then now and then going to Dr. King. You know, Dr. Dr. King got tired. You know, yeah. we, we've read narratives and things. He got so that that to me is like his hands is coming down. But those who came along and cut the hands up, those who kept pushing and kept going, the yeah. the the boy, bus boycott was able to continue because they pulled together as a community and were giving each other rides. So it lasted more than a year because it was able and we were able to support. Yeah. And so. One of the things that I say uh, to my students is, what is your role and your niche? We all do not have to be Dr. King. We all do not have to be Malcolm X. We all do not have to be you know, Patrice Lumumba, Kwame, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, so on and so forth. Yeah. But we are ourselves. You know, at, sometimes Dr. King needed Mahalia Jackson to sing. Sometimes... Yeah. Um, and and I, I I told my students I applaud 
are people who are willing to go to jail. I, I pray for them that there is a hedge of protection around them, that yeah. they are not being like that. But I also know I'm not going to jail. Uh, yeah. uh, I, that's not my role. Right. But right. I got you. I am, but, you know, I tell them we, we also need those people. Who's, who, who, where are the black journalists? who are writing from our experience and who are not skewing and who are giving a true record and historic of our, of our, who are the one we do need our lawyers who will defend those of us who were arrested as we take a stand against these things. And so yeah. sometimes it seems like the battle fatigue, because it's, this is a battle, this is a war. Um, yeah. And it's a, it's not just a, a war, but it's a war on our lives. It's a war um, and, and our psyche and our spirit and who we are in, in humanity. And so being able to uh, know our role, know our, our niche, find it and, and, and be able to hold, keep the hands up. Because yes. we also don't go into battle thinking we're going to lose. Um, right. Right. I have I haven't played competitive ball in I don't know how long. But right now, to on this day, if you know Cynthia Cooper, Cheryl Swoops, uh, <laughs> even LeBron James, if they were if they were to tell me right now that we're going to have a basketball game right now, I'm going to say yeah. okay, bet and I'm going to win. Because yeah. we don't go, we don't go into a battle with a with a negative losing mindset. We go into this. No, no, we're going to win. We're going to win, yeah. and we have, it. and and doing that. So, what is what is your role as a pastor in keeping those hands up? All right, um, very very well well put there. Uh, I my role, I kind of think of myself as in many ways, a life coach uh, to downtrodden. You know, I, I, as I open with, you know, I, I come from Watts, I come from uh, living in many different places, many different homes, impoverished. Uh, my dad was in and out of prison most of my life, uh, single mom, you know, so, so in, in, in many ways, I am a living, breathing statistic. And so what I, what I have always done my whole life, I have looked at the bad that has come my way. I've looked at the unfortunate circumstances. I've looked at uh, the systemic cycle of depression in my household and substance abuse and all of those things. I look at how they affected my dad and my mom and their relationship and the household and how, how uh, m money was tight. And all of those examples I just gave you, I see it in my members the very members that may have been abused, may have been misused, may have been psychologically abused, physically abused, emotionally abused. I see members who uh, have had money so tight all of their lives. I see people who've been hooked on drugs and alcohol. And my role as a change agent is to empower them with the word of God that will tell them that they are beautifully and wonderfully made. Uh, so my, my, my role is to make sure when they leave the church on Sunday, that, that uh, uh, they're not uh, more depressed when they came in. You know, my, my role is not, of course, not to make you know, people are always happy, joy, joy. But my role is to tell the truth like it is and uh, give them some help and some notes on how to get out of the truth that they're in to the truth that they want to be in. And so um, I really think uh, God allowed me providentially, he allowed me to go through all the stories that we have no time to tell <laughs> that God allowed me to experience because I see 
if not everything in the members that I pastor and how God has allowed me to experience most of it from a third party point of view and knowing what it does to people, how it brings people down. And he's allowed me to preach in a pulpit where I can use those, those same things that bring people down and show them that you are more than a conqueror. You know, show show them that that you are you are greater than your greatest defeat. You know, show show them that that you don't have to be hooked on drugs all your life. You don't have to be a statistic. You can look at the statistics and say, you know, well, statistically, I'm supposed to be just like my daddy or my mama. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to trust God and I'm going to do something different. And so my role, I kind of think, is a change agent, life coach, and a drill sergeant. You know, I'm trying to drill it in people's mind that you can do better because of the pain of your past. Don't let the pain of your past nail you to a cross because even Jesus got up. And I think if people hear that, if people know that they should not be stuck in the same condition. They should not be limited to what was done to them. They should not be boxed in to a societal statistical norm, but that they can think outside of that box and realize that there's power in them. The very one that would not speak up is me. I was the one in class who really didn't want to say anything, didn't want to raise my hand because I had a really bad stutter. And so God used my inability to show and tell others that man, woman, girl, boy, you've got a story to tell. And nothing is so bad that we have done that the love of God cannot erase and the power of God cannot place us into the next level. Thank you. And we appreciate that. Um, and, and we can see that with how uh, New Providence has served the, the community you know, before, before being in quarantine. Um, on, the, the, on second Saturday, I believe it is, with the food drive and um, and one of one of the reasons why you know brought you on for for the community hour, I alluded to this earlier, is the the, the saying that you know black pastors today do not uh, do anything for the for the community and things like that. And we we started talking about media and, and control, and um, it is a hope and a and a desire that naturally shows shows the pastors who are doing who are working and and who actually do fall under um james cone's black liberation theology yeah. Um, yeah. so many times the bad is being spread virally when we don't actually see the black community pastors who are who are doing um this work and not just in doing the work of the lord um but also doing this work for our community um and yeah. you are someone who i who i have seen you know, um, going to the hospitals, going, um, figuring out how to help pay, uh, help somebody in the congregation pay their, their rent or whatever it is they do. Um, somebody who just walks into the church um, uh, uh, and, you know, might be homeless or on a judgment and you, and you talk to them and you, and you help them and, and, and it, it's loving and it's come from um, your heart and, and, I believe, and it is natural we believe that we we show this because this is what is empowering when we show and and continue the narrative of the of the good and the positive and the uplifting that is going on and and not all, and, and it's it, and what does it do for our spirit what does it do for our mental and our and our and our psyche um and especially coming from one with the with the psychology background um so how do so how do you bridge your uh, this is and this is probably my last question but bridge your psychology background with your biblical uh, your master's in divinity I, I, yeah. I forgot 
Yeah, theology. masters in, 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 divinity, in theology. Thank you. And and bring that in. Um, and, and how do you see that continuing uh, throughout the quarantine and then after the quarantine? Um, I often say in my church that we should be the feet in the hands of Jesus. And you, you, uh, some time back invited me to a panel discussion and I remembered one of the things I said was uh, sort of um, controversial, if you will, but I wanted it to be known that um, for the people that, you know, don't necessarily believe in Jesus Christ or the Bible, that I made it very clear that I do not um, support Jesus Christ based on color of skin, but I support and I stand on the word of Christ. And so that, that, that should be uh, strategically different. And that, that said, uh, the bridge being, taking a look at what Jesus did and how he reached anyone especially he loved to reach the downtrodden, the ones that society had left alone, the ones uh, like he tells the parable about the uh, good Samaritan, you know, who's left on the side of the road and the priest goes by and say, hey man, I don't know, I don't know you, you know, the, the uh, religious leaders go by and the one that stopped was somebody that socially, culturally was not supposed to have anything to do with this man. But not only did he stop, but he he took care of he took care of his wounds. He bandaged him up and he he paid his hotel, you know, so that he would be well. And so that example really speaks to the depth of the human condition and how people really need to know that God cares. And I really believe I'm so glad that you had you had me on today because I really believe God has placed me in the past people to let them know that the Jesus Christ in everybody's life shows the care of God. And so when you talk about, you know, being a Christian or acts of Jesus Christ, and you, you may not necessarily have to identify yourself uh, with a religion per se, but I really think of Jesus as, as uh, not just my, my personal Lord and Savior, but I think of the movement of bridging the psychology and bridging the care of God together because the man on the side of the road that he tells the story about was hurting, was bleeding, was bruised, was battered. He, he had been robbed. He had been left there. But God looks beyond the societal uh, 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 rules. You know, God, God looks beyond all of those things and he sees our hurt. And, and so notice in that story, he didn't preach Bible to him, <laughs> but he helped him. He didn't say as recorded in the books of Moses, right? <laughs> he, but he, he told, he helped them. He answered what was physically impairing him. Physically, he was almost dead. But the love of God came and arrested him and comforted him and, and healed him as, of his affliction. And so dealing from the pulpit weekly, it's a psychological and theological marrying that I want the people to know that this God that they serve is not some fictitious monument that we worship as a statue on Sunday, but the God that we serve is a God who cares and who is willing to address the needs, the present day needs of those who call on him. And so I would say 
if I were to be, you know, theologically correct, that Jesus Christ is that bridge, that the reason why the church is still running 3,000 years, 2,000 years after Christ, and these so many churches around the world is because of the power of God to tell somebody that God cares. That's why he sent his only begotten son, right? For God so loved the world. And so if we don't, we really have to be careful as spiritual advisors and leaders that our personal humanity does not pollute God's divinity. And like you said earlier, you know, your group highlights churches who are actually doing something. I, I appreciate that. But I kind of think of myself as just the conduit to doing greater works for more people. That it's not me who is to be praised because one day I'm going to die like everybody else. <laughs> but the work still has to go on. So in the process of meeting the psych psychological and bridging that with the theological, we have to raise up soldiers who are willing to take on the work and not just defend the gospel, but take the gospel out. And I don't, I don't know if you have time for this, but I have to say it. My problem this week has been struggling with white America who calls themselves Christian. Go for it. And yet they don't acknowledge us in any formality. We're almost an afterthought. And historically, as you well know, we were brought here against our will. And the only reason they have attitude now is because they can't control us. And so because they can't control us, they must kill us. And so we have to be aware that the white Protestant needs to be evangelized. The one that thinks that they're better than anyone else the one who is the majority, you know, leader in the House and the Senate and all of those other places who has so many votes and who who who's so who's so uh, uh, above the little black man struggling in Detroit and Compton and Watts and uh, Atlanta and struggling in Tallahassee and struggling in, in Houston and trying to make it just trying to do better for himself. They won't look his way. And we have to do better to make sure that when they see us, they not only see a black man, but they see Jesus. They see the power of God resting in a brown body. And I want to, I want to be one of the ones who tell as many as I can, be who you are and be proud of who you are. But make sure that you stand your ground because the other side is going to stand their ground. Right. And it is important for us to stand our ground. You know, throughout history, you know, the Black church and Black pastors have stood their ground and, um, and were, were and have been pillars to the movements that have continued to progress and empower and, and heal our people. And, um, and, and, and I, I love what you said about how, how the other side needs to be evangelized looking, uh, look at that because they're not practicing what they say and claim to be. If that was the case, they themselves would be killing us and they are. Um, and, and, and navigating that, this is why it's so important to read and understand, uh, David Walker, um, yes. who, uh, you know, 
his appeal in the 1850s and 60s who was talking about raising the standard of being black Christians and what does that mean and taking a stand against people who are not act, who are not even practicing what they claim to be, believe um, yeah. and we take and um, in in Dr. King's autobiography in chap, in the fourth chapter he said he talked about how believers uh, Christi- Christians uh, white black so on and so forth, were asking him why he was taking such a stance and why he was talking, um, you know, singing the spirituals, we shall overcome and, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that he said was he is a zygous of his time. Yeah. And he is, he is, uh, I'm, I'm using his words, but he was a vessel for uh, what God called him to be, and God called him to be a zygous of his time, and do this, and you and you hear him talking about a uh, temp, uh, temporary segregation to amass power, to accumulate power within the black community, and he even started to separate himself from white liberals, right ministers, so on and so forth, who said that they were allies, but only allies of so far. Okay, now you're getting out of control. Now you're trying to do a little bit too much. And, you're, and, right. he, said, and he said, no, he stood his ground. You know, he was like, no, this is not okay. Right. Um, and the, having that. And so it's so important to remember that when, uh, when, when God has purpose in your heart uh, and, and your role and what it is supposed to be, as you said, for you, it's a change agent and life coach and bridging the theology and the psychology. And so for us, um, you know, in even those who do not, who are not Christians, as you were talking about and everything, we still have roles. And for those of us, those of us who are Christians, there are so many times in the classroom, I, I have students who say, well, can I really, can I really do black stuff and be a Christian? Well, they said, I can't, and things like that, you know, you can, and you can be firm and complete in who you are and, and, and stand in that and stand and walk in your power and what it is you're going to do and be, and be a vessel uh, to amass and, and to create change and to empower ourselves, empower our people and progress and continue to move forward. So we thank you for this time. We thank you for your words. Um, and, you know, natural we is not, con- is not worried about, controversy. A lot of times controversy and not only controversy, but a lot of times having these discussions in a meaningful and respectful way is a way for us to figure out how to continue to move forward. As I said before, and Pastor, you alluded to it as well, that, you know, in talking about what do we do as Black people, we and I said we all have roles and we all are going to have difference of opinion and that is good because it it's in the it's in those conversations it's in those mindsets that we can actually have a strategy. Right. We said that this is and and when you look at when you look at the Bible, you know, uh, it said uh, and you can help me remember where this is because I don't remember. It says that we, we are all um, members of one body. We all have our roles. And then I think in Corinthians, it says, you know, we all have different gifts. Yeah. And so Pastor McKinney's yeah. gift is to be a change agent. And he is in being a life coach and bridging the theology and the spirituality. And he, and he does it every, not only does he do it every single Sunday, but he does it um, on the new Providence Facebook page and Instagram page with his, uh, incur- words of encouragement, four and five minute excerpts um, on the on the Instagram and on the Facebook. Um, I think he posted one today. Um, mm-hmm. But and, and so with natural we, uh, you know, ours is to bring people like you on to bring to bring all of these people who are doing different things within the within the community and society. And what does that mean? And so we're thankful for New Providence. Um, and so I know that we are beyond our um, hour, but if you can just say one final word, exhortation, if you want to pray um, about, you know, our people um, moving forward, progressing, um, and, you know, and still being in this quarantine as it's challenging people's mental health, um, it's challenging um, people's spiritual health. Um, I'm just going to, you know, give you the floor for another five or six minutes, and then we will, um, and then we'll, we'll, I'll say a final word, and we're in from there. Okay, um, you know, 
this quarantine has been very difficult on a lot of people. And so my, my uh, thoughts and prayers go to those who have lost their jobs and those who are struggling uh, financially from, from this. And uh, uh, at church, I've been in this series called Life in Quarantine. And um, I've really been looking at different characters uh, and their lives and how their lives really show, um, you know, seasons of quarantine. And uh, uh, last Sunday I talked about Job and, and how, how we know Job. We know Job's story. Even non-Christians know, know Job's story and how, how Job lost everything he had and uh, lost his popularity, lost uh, his 10 children lost his cattle, his farm, his, everything he had. And he, was, you know, well-respected. He was uh, well-to-do, uh, but uh, he lacked, he uh, had a control issue. And so this quarantine t shows us how the good news that I brought out on Sunday is that uh the good news is we are not in control. <laughs> and I think that that really psychologically stretches some people because the, the base humanistic, you know, capability is to control, right? We put on our own clothing, right? We bathe ourselves. We, we go to work. We do this, everything by ourselves, you know? So we have so much control over what we do. Now this quarantine really strips away, you know, where we can go and we can't go into work. People have lost their jobs, etc. So my, my encouragement is uh, that you really consider that God is in control. And if God is in control, and I have to put the word if there as a conjunction, because some people will wrestle with that. If we are in control, uh, sometimes we listen to the depressing, the depressed voice, if you will. Mm -hmm. We listen to the hurt voice. We listen to uh, the voice from the past. But if we listen to God's voice and knowing that God is in control of everything, and now I don't want to, you know, push people out there that, that may perhaps don't believe in God. And they'll say, well, pastor, you know, you, <laughs> you, you trying to support people listening to voices, but I'm saying when you open up and read some of the scriptures of encouragement that will tell you uh, that I am with you always, even until the end of the world, which there, there's so much encouragement throughout the Bible. And if you tune into our Facebook broadcast and our, our Instagram page as well, that there's some good news for people that are stuck and don't know what to do. And you might be suffering mentally. It's, it might be overwhelming for you trying to figure out what you're going to do next. Well, as I told them Sunday, the good news is if I am not in control, I am able to let God be God and allow myself to relax and say, I'm just going to wait and see what happens. And I think a lot of more people, there was a news article that said, you know, we've, we have all these COVID cases, but we've had very few heart attacks and strokes. And I believe that's because people have backed up. They've had some time to really consider what really matters. They've had some time to sit down. They've had some time to think about things. They've had some time to, to deal uh, uh, with some things, some projects that they perhaps couldn't have gotten to. But this time has allowed us 
some good things. And if we focus on the good things in quarantine, if we keep ourselves busy and be creative and do things that are fun like this, you know, uh, mm-hmm. take, take some Zoom calls, uh, have a panel discussion, get some questions answered, start a forum. We do things like that. We will continue to engage ourselves. And one of the major things that I drive home at the church is encourage each other. And if we continue to reach out by social media, we perhaps can't shake a hand, we can't hug nobody, you know, but if we can encourage somebody and and just let them know that I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you, those are some blessed ways on how to stay encouraged yourself because even when we feel like life is out of control, if we take the time to encourage somebody else and use the last of our strength to do so, I'm a firm believer and God has done it before in my life that God will replenish me and you for giving out to somebody else. And so my encouragement is encourage somebody else and just wait to see what God has for us. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, we're, we're thankful. Um, not not only for being on the, the Zoom hour, but for all that you do, that New Providence does. Um, Natural We is excited. Uh, we do have some more partnerships coming up um, that we will have more information on soon concerning a community feeding. So we are just grateful. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for being part of the Natural We community, um, the Hour of Power. We're excited. Next week, Sandra Coleman is our guest, and she will be talking about her jewelry and just being a, a small Black-owned business during this time and how she has been able to stay afloat, how we can support her, things of that nature. So everyone, please have a great evening. We thank you for all that you do, and take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Mm-hmm.